And tonight we were going to do three things. We were going to look at some additional verses that um, question sola fides. We were going to look at some verses that are used to justify sola fides. And then we were going to try to sort of put it all together into a uh, 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 defense of how do you respond to the question, how are you saved or are you saved? And, uh, and you know, sort of counterattack in, in a way that hopefully will be compelling. So why don't we begin with, uh, and probably try to spend about maybe 15 more minutes on it, on um, the uh, verses in scripture that tend to suggest that sola fides does not offer a, a complete story for justification and salvation. Um, so let's start with the, the Jesus parable of the weeds and the tares uh, in chapter 13 of St. Matthew's gospel. Last week we had read from near the end of Sermon on the Mount where Jesus, uh, where uh, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the, the kingdom of heaven. So this is very much uh, in that vein, verses 24 through 30. Another parable he put before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sowing, his enemy sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So it's a kingdom of heaven parable. And Jesus' message is that, of course, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the parable partly deals with judgment and uh, eternal life. But it also deals with the kingdom of heaven as a present reality, right? And in that kingdom of heaven, there are weeds and there are tares. So to put it another way, all of these people, both the weeds and the tares, profess to be disciples of Christ. Yet some of them have fallen under the influence of the evil one. Some of them will not be found worthy. Some of them are certainly not justified. So we have a mixture within the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is to say within the church of weeds and wheat, of those who will be found justified and of those who won't. Similarly, Matthew chapter 25, verse, verses 31 through 56. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. 
I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So notice here, this, this isn't necessarily explicitly purely a judgment of the church or of disciples, but it is a judgment based on, and, and faith isn't explicitly mentioned, but it is a judgment based on works. So the, the implication is that faith is reflected in works, that faith and love of God and trust of God is reflected in compassion and love for one's neighbor. And without that, faith is fundamentally meaningless. That's basically, uh, the message from from uh, from James, and in fact, why don't we look at James? It's uh, chapter two, verse fourteen. Luther profoundly disliked James's letter, um, which he characterized an, as an epistle of straw. And so in his German version of the New Testament, he relegated it to the back sort of questionable works that were uh, included in the corpus of the New Testament uh, without particularly good reason. Sorry, what was that, James? What? Sorry. Chapter 2, verse 14. Okay. What does it profit, my brethren? If a man says he has faith, but has not works, can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. And, and the parable uh, of the, uh, the sheep and the goats implies that faith without works uh, results in condemnation and not justification. So, <laughs> so the... Uh, At the conclusion of chapter five of the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus, um, we, we read this um, last week, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The conclusion in verse 48 is you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. A perfection is obviously some a goal that we never reach and can never possibly reach since we ourselves are not God. But it's nevertheless something that we have to strive for 
and contempt for. We have to attempt to be perfect. And that means doing something. And it also it means growing in holiness. So salvation through faith is not sufficient. It's simply not enough. It would seem that people who say that is, it's, it's just a falsehood. It's like they aren't being honest. They're, they're false. You know, thinking they can talk and yet uh, not do anything to help and they're, you know, they're still righteous. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, it's a self-deception. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, it is untrue, but, but a basic problem is that, you know, we often have a tendency to deceive ourselves. You know, I mean, that's, although we, we often have lost, lost the, um, lost the, um, the meaning through, you know, sort of ritual, um, ritual pronouncements or, you know, ritually pronouncing something rather than thinking about it, but the purpose of the creeds is to have us examine ourselves and reflect about what we're professing and hopefully free ourselves for self -deception, from self-deception. You know, so for example, I believe in one God. Do we really? How many of us don't be believe in more than one God? Our culture believes in a number. You know, we have Mars, the god of war. Many Christians believe in Mars. All of the, the Christians who are really uh, militant promoters of our so-called Second Amendment, Second Amendment rights are worshipers of Mars. Aries, Aphrodite, the gods of pleasure and sex, prosperity theology is fundamentally uh, a form of, of idolatry that worships Aphrodite. So do we believe in one God? I mean, that, that's what we're professing it because the point is uh, we're supposed to examine ourselves and determine whether we really believe in one God. And if we think we're straying toward idolatry, then we need to do something about that. The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, do we believe that all things come from God? Or do we believe that they come from our own efforts? Do we actually have the presumption and arrogance to believe that we've earned something? So we can go on like that. The same is also true of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer you know, is designed to help us examine our self-deceptions. Our Father who art in heaven, doesn't heaven isn't to be conceived of as a place heaven is to be conceived of as god is transcendent but in contemporary christianity god and jesus are our best buds right i have a friend in jesus that's there's no transcendence there there's no god as other we don't recognize god's others others God's otherness. And if we don't recognize God's otherness, then we don't know who God is. And if we don't know who God is, we're not very good Christians. 
So, you know, self-deception, it's, it's a trap into which as human beings, we, we very easily fall and constantly fall. And so the creeds, the Lord's Prayer, the Confidior, the Mass, you know, is intended to help us to recognize our own self-deceptions. It seems that a fear of the Lord is missing when, when people cannot have that respect and, and um, believing solely in, you know, the one God. It seems like, you know, that's a, an indication of lack of, well, no more fear of the Lord, lack mm -hmm. of uh, true belief. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, very definitely. There's another side of it that there's only fear of the Lord and not a recognition of, and we see that, you know, from uh, you know, the, the sort of Christian groups that are very much living in the Old Testament and, you know, living, seeing an image of God who's a God of vengeance and a God of wrath and a God of anger. You know, they certainly see, uh, approach God with reverence, but they also typically don't see God as a loving God or a merciful God. So we have, you know, the two extremes, but the first one is at this point, in America at least, you know, the, I think the greatest uh, trend so, other questions or comments about that? Now, let's look at some of the, uh, the uh, so-called proofs of sola scriptura, uh, not sola scriptura, sola fides, to see if we can see what's wrong with them. Let's start with Romans chapter 3. Verse 28, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. And in his German translation of the New Testament, uh, Luther translated it, added a word. So he had it, for we hold that a man is justified by faith alone apart from works of law. He added the alone to justify the doctrine of sola uh, fides. And uh, in when he was attacked for that, he argued that it conveys the sense of the text. If the translation is to be clear and vigorous, it belongs there. Or to put it another way, you add the, the things that are, the clarifications that are pleasing to you. What is it they say about adding or subtracting from what is written? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Well, well, that's in that's in Revelation, and it actually really only applies to Revelation. Oh, does it? Since okay. since it's only it's only coinc I mean, it's only coincidentally that it's the last book of the Bible, and only <laughs> coincidentally indeed that it's in the Bible at all. So. But, well, but nevertheless, yeah, nevertheless, if we, you know, the, the, if, we, uh, if we provide the translations that are, that are convenient to us, then, you know, there's, there's always going to be uh, a problem. And, you know, to a degree that problem is always, in fact, always exists in translation since you have to you know, make decisions about what the translation means in the first place to translate it. And so, and I think always... it's pretty clear at the end of that paragraph, it says, on the contrary, we uphold the law. So mm -hmm. even though it says, uh, you know, we can be apart from works of the law. Right. Well, it sounds like he needs some guidance on his <laughs> interpretation. Yeah, interpretation. Like the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the problem. People are seeking convenience. Paste and cut. Yeah. Or cut and paste, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when they hear people preaching that, then the, there are too many people eager to see how better that sounds and they join up. They don't realize how far they're separating themselves. Well, what's wrong but, with... Um... What's wrong with Luther's interpretation? Was that Luther's interpretation of that verse? Uh, Are you talking? Yeah. Are yeah, you talking about wrong. just that verse? I'm talking about about the verse and its context. Remember that you know we should always that that. Typically, our separated brethren like to proof text, right? So, you know, Paul Well, says, you know, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking just the very act of what he does by inserting a word there to make it better just shows how he's not following the faith by his works at all he's trying to change it you know uh based on you know just saying he believes and this is how you can believe and not worry about you know how you live your life and try to imitate christ but he, he's not a, he's not actually saying that that's not well, if, if he Luther, says justified by faith alone. Luther, Luther believes that the fruit of, of uh, the fruit of faith is works, but those works result from the Holy Spirit. They don't result from human effort or from uh, you know, deliberate human action. They result from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is solely to be credited with with works um, the modern uh, more contemporary you know evangelicalism has departed from that but but that was a that, that in any case was Luther's view well if the Holy Spirit is is working but through you that wouldn't that but but let's focus on Romans chapter 28 mm -hmm. what's wrong what's the issue there what Romans are the issues chapter 28 verse For, chapter, oh, three, no. chapter 3 <laughs> verse 28 well if he is he is he calling the works of the law the the law that the jews would would follow and no, knowing that you don't have to follow that law anymore, just your faith is which brings together everybody for the Gentiles too. And, and they don't have to worry about the, the old law. Their, their faith alone will be all they need. It right, sounds so he, like he's trying to say. He's contrasting faith with the Mosaic law. Yeah. By, by uh, implication, you know, one can expand from the, the Mosaic law to general works. So it's a fundamental principle of Christianity that, that we're saved by faith. But the problem comes in with the saved by faith alone, with you know the assurance of salvation. So, so one of the the striking things is that Paul begins verse twenty seven with, "Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded on what principle? On the principle of works? No." on the principle of faith. 
For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. So you notice no boasting. Why would you boast? In the Mosaic law, you would boast because you've observed the law, right? And therefore, you're justified before God. But Paul argues that you can't possibly be justified by before God through the Mosaic law because you can't possibly keep the law in its entirety. So faith has its origin in grace from God and from Christ's redemptive act on the cross, right? So the implication of that is we're saved not by anything we've done, but by what God has done. And so that eliminates boasting because there's nothing to boast about. We haven't right. done anything. Right. In some sense, this has nothing to do with us. At the same time, it has everything to do with us. So both of those statements are true. But now focus on the boasting part. The boasting is a sense of entitlement, right? So the boasting that Paul is focusing on particularly is that I am, I have observed the law. I observe the law. I observe the Mosaic law. I observe God's law. Therefore, I'm justified before God. But if you're boasting in your salvation, which is really what the assurance of salvation is and what I'm saved, are you saved, suggests. Then you've relocated salvation to rest with you, right? I'm saved and I know I'm saved. That's a form of boasting. One can call it, you know, sort of certainty because that's what the Bible teaches. But that's, you know, something of a stretch. Well, it seems like you've got the swing of a pendulum in one direction is faith alone is justified. The other one is acts, you know, uh, are what justify you, but you can't separate them. Well, they have to both be. No, nobody has, nobody has, no Christian has ever argued for justification through works. That's, that's, um, that's a common misconception that some of our separated brethren have. Uh, but, you know, even Sproul says that it's incorrect that no one has argued for justification for work, through works. So the, so the justification through, through works, through the works of the law is really about justification through the Mosaic law. So it's you know limited to that. It doesn't justification through works doesn't apply right. to to uh, to Christian to Christianity at all. Right. But either way, it's you can't have just one or the other, can you? It seems like it has to be a combination of the strong faith and which would naturally um, create this. Um, passion for working, you know, imitating Christ. Christ, you know, didn't live his life without uh, doing anything, but just teaching of the faith. He, you know, he talked about, you know, helping, you mm -hmm. know, the sick, visiting ones in prison. You know, he, I mean, you've got to, you can't have one without the other, it seems. Right.
it kind of seems if you're going to push one or the other, that would be just a form of boasting because you're, you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. You're just uh, feeling good about yourself. So, um, so that's one sort of issue with this. We can, all, if we also look more broadly at this section of Romans within the context of the surrounding chapters. So Paul is. Um, starts by trying to build a case of the need of salvation as revealed in the gospel because the Mosaic law as a guide to righteousness is insufficient. And so here he describes how salvation through faith in Christ is, is obtained and then in chapters five through eight, he describes the effects of salvation. Yeah, but, he leaves a, yeah. but he leaves a gap in the argument. He has no discussion of the nature of salvation. So his concern is with how humankind has become justified, not with life after justification. Let's take a, a quick look at just the very beginning of chapter 12 of Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. For as in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them uh, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So you know some things about that. First of all, there is no need to um, be worried about being conformed to the world if we have an assurance of salvation. Also notice the present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It can be argued that that's a Eucharistic reference. And then also notice that the focus is not on individual salvation. The focus is on the melding of one's gifts or the use of one's gifts within the broader context of the church 
so that you know in the church we are all on the one hand individuals with unique gifts right. but on the other hand those gifts combine into what is hopefully one harmonious whole in the service of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no need for any of this discussion if one, it's a matter of simple salvation, two, once saved, always saved, if salvation is not a process, and if it were all about us, but it's not. And then quickly looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 8. Start at verse 5. What, is, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are equal, and each shall receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So notice he ascribes the, the uh, activity, whether from Paul himself or Apollos, to God's grace, the fruit to God's grace. And yet at the same time, there's a reward for him, for Apollos, why would there be a reward? Well, the reward wouldn't be individual, right? It would be communal. Um, well, Maybe. no, both individual and communal. I mean, he, he's talking here pre predominantly, I think, about uh, each will receive wages according to the labor of each. So he's talking about himself. Why does he deserve a reward? Why does he think he deserves a reward? He's a worker. He's chosen from his free will to cooperate with God's grace. Mm. That's a choice. And for making the choice, he deserves a reward. Is that's, the grace to what, be Terry? With God to receive the grace to be with God. In, in eternity, I mean, you know, that's basically, you know, what we're doing by being good Christians, we're doing, we're behaving in, in the manner, you know, um, along God's plan for his grace and every everything we accomplished uh, or accomplish, every gift we have, we attribute it to God, not ourselves. Let's um, move on to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Are there any problems there as a defense of sola fides? Does anyone see any problems? Well, I, I, I don't know. It seems like they're talking about 
they're justified by faith. Um, and knowing that the, you know, um, where it says boasting you know, of our afflictions produces in the endurance, endurance proven character, proven character hope, um, you know, but it's, I don't know, there's no um, sense of, of substance really in those words. How do you get endurance or hope or character without serving, you know, and just professing faith? Uh, through suffering. Yeah. It just, you know, it's uh, just kind of empty. Well, I wouldn't say it's empty. I, I would say it doesn't establish solo fides. I, I think oh, it's yeah. Hard, yeah, definitely not empty. So it, it starts with, therefore, since we are justified by faith. So the assumption then is of justification, which is what the previous part, including chapter three and the verse we just read were about. So that justification by faith is assumed. And now Paul is going to examine the blessings or the, uh, the fruit that comes from just the blessings that come from justification. So then to then use this again as proof of justification is to take it completely out of context since this isn't about justification. This is about the blessings that stem from justification. Then yeah. another problem is that uh, Paul writes that uh, we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Last week we read from uh, Romans chapter 8 verses 24 through 26 that we don't hope for certainties. If something is certain, you don't hope for it, right? Right. I don't hope I get my paycheck tomorrow unless my employer is on, you know, very shaky ground and might not pay my salary, right? Or you're furloughed. <laughs> yeah. So there's no there's no hope there. I mean, there's there's you know if, right. if there's yeah. a hope, you're not certain. Hope and certainty are diametrically opposed. That's true. So this is completely taken out of context fundamentally and doesn't even prove the thing uh, at the most superficial level, doesn't even prove the thing it's supposed to. Let's move on to verse 15. But the free gift of justification is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The, so the argument then about this or the interpretation of this from the viewpoint of sola fides is that Christ's free gift alone makes us righteous. What's wrong? with that but well, it seems like they're going back to just thinking by his death he saved everyone so and that was it they don't don't have to live a life you know as a christian you know trying to imitate him um well uh, 
by his death, what did he do? I'm sorry, what? I, by, what? by his death, what did he do? Well, he redeemed us. Exactly, he redeemed us. Paul writes, if many died through one man's trespass, how much more have the grace of God, the free gift and the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Who are the many who died through one man's trespass? Everybody after Adam. Everybody. Yeah. Who are the many who are... Uh, um, for whom the uh, grace of God and the free gift abounded. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Everyone is redeemed by the cross. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So this isn't about really justification. It's about the redempt Christ's redemptive act becoming available to everyone in, in contradistinction to the sin of the law. And then immediately after that, in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that great grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. So justification involves transformation. And the fact that he says, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Right. Suggests that he's not sort of pulling arguments, pulling theoretical arguments out of his hat, right? Like maybe somebody is going to think, clearly somebody has thought. <laughs> and he's so, if we're simply justified by faith alone, then indeed we can continue to sin. Or that's the implication of what Paul is saying or the reason that he's inserted this here right after the section on redemption. Let's look at Ephesians. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. So the proof texting stops there, but if we continue to the next verse, it becomes very unfortunate. For we are his worksmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So ostensibly our justification should result in good works. Well, it seems like, you know, the redemption, Jesus dying on the cross, that was a gift. It wasn't a justification. Well, but, no, justification is separate from right. redemption. And, but, but, you know, the we need to live a life of Christ. You know, we need to do that transforming to be right. able to, you know, receive the graces and, and to get salvation. We can't just 
live in sin. Mm -hmm. Let's take a, a look, not a proof text, but a, a final closing. <clears throat> uh, citation from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. This whole section details lapses among Christians, simpleness among Christians. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you and of a kind that is not found even among pagans. So notice that even among pagans, we, we hear that you know, today frequently from uh, people critiquing the, the, the behavior and the morality of Christians that even by the standards of the world, Christians are sinful, that people in the world don't do that stuff. And that's a really heavy indictment because you know it means you've totally um, cast aside the gospel and right. cast aside any any semblance of imitating Christ in order to do what you want. And so that's what Paul is talking about here, and precisely, you know, the danger that that poses if you think you're saved by faith and you don't have to do anything then you're really missing the point right. so and of a kind that is not found even among pagans for a man is living with his father's wife and you are arrogant ought you not rather to mourn let him who has done this be removed from among you so this is okay with everybody. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens all the dough? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be new dough as you really are unleavened. I wrote you in my letter not to associate, verse nine, not to associate with the moral men not at all meaning the immorality of this world or the greedy and robbers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But rather, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or robber, not even to eat with such a one. But what have I to do with judging outsiders? So behavior matters, works matter, character matters. Right. And you know, in much of Christianity today, behavior does not matter. Character certainly does not matter, and right. works don't matter. Right. What matters is the assurance of salvation. And that's not Paul's message. So any final thoughts? We're, we're close to running out of time. And I sort of do want to try to do the last part. Um, are we, do we feel that we're able to defend? Yes, I think you've faith. covered it really well. Really, yeah. I think we're ready to move on because I think this is really clear. So when someone says, are you saved? How do you respond? Just still working on it. That's right. <laughs> how do you respond offensively in a way that defends the faith, that makes them question their presuppositions? We're not done until we're dead. <laughs> And then God will judge us then. Right. But what makes them, but they'll just dismiss that as, you know, 
<clears throat> dumb Catholic teaching. <laughs> How can you engage? Well, I'd deeply? ask them when they were when they feel they were saved. That they're and going find to give out you, what they say. They're going to give you an answer. Yeah, but everybody you know. knows when they're saved, so that's you know that's kind of a a trap. But we're and never after really they finish, saved. Go we're ahead, never Carl. really saved from sin because we are human. Right, so no, but 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 an ongoing battle. <laughs> but evangelicals will will uh, and people who believe in in uh, sola fides for the most part will be able to identify the moment at which they were saved and yeah. remember well, salvation salvation is an event and not a process so once uh once i can identify the moment it's a done deal so that's well, you know pretty good so yeah, so, but, so what are the how do you make inroads into that well isn't salvation the act of saving it's it's in the it's the well, act. And that, that's how. Yeah, but remember, you have to engage. You you can't, uh, you know, run a parallel right. argument. Well, you think it's an event, but the church says that it's uh, it's a process. Well, the church is, you know, heretical. Has you know abandoned the teachings of Christ. It's, well, it does doesn't read the Bible. You know, you Catholics are dumb anyway. So well, I guess I I say I was saved at, at my baptism, which opened up my life to um, sacraments for being for receiving the graces to gain eternity. Right, but, but and, this is, and actually be saved. But but this is still a parallel argument. You know, they're saying one thing, you're saying another thing, and there's no confrontation. There's at no point do they meet. So, you know, you're going your separate way and and there's no there's no uh, apologetic involved. There's just, I have my opinion and you have your opinion. You know, the, the important thing is that we try to uh, collide with their opinion in a way that at least, you know, at some point may force a, re, a, a re evaluation of, you know, the evidence at hand. So how do you do that? Well, I guess I would, I would go back to the idea of having been saved with my at my baptism and reaching living my life for that final judgment yeah, yeah, where yeah, but, I will but, be but, saved. Terry, you're you're rehashing Catholic <laughs> theology. The, the rehash doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I'd even want to bother with someone <laughs> you know who well, that's that, that that's a question, you know. But in in I mean, you know, for me personally, although you know I don't do it typically very nicely or, you know, in a spirit of love as one is supposed to, uh, but you know, nevertheless, um, you know, this stuff sort of. Um, You can look at them and just say, "Are you? How are you saved? How how do you think you're saved?" Give that's, them a question. Right, that's good. Ask that's a question. A well, or, so you or not so much, saying, not so much how, but why, or how is okay too. And and you need to, you know, we just need to be humble and say we don't know if we're saved. But we're trying, and we ask for forgiveness by going to confession and receiving the sacraments and by, by reading scripture to, to educate us in, in the ways that God wants us to behave. Well, a good thing to do is, is to turn to scripture, right? So, 
So, you know, but they're I saved. I can't memorize all and, these different And verses. so, well, a really easy one is Paul says that if you confess, we discussed this last week, if you confess with your, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, uh, you'll be saved, right? So, uh, so you can ask, you know, do you agree with that? You know, we agree with it, right? Paul said it. Yeah. So you ask them if they agree with that. And so that, that you know, kind of should throw them for a loop since Catholics shouldn't be, you know, citing that. <laughs> since it's ah. proof of sola fides. And then you ask, you know, so. And where um, was that, John? Where was that again? Um, good question. Because I don't remember. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Okay. okay. Um, so the, the, um, so Are then, you? you know, so <laughs> you ask them if they agree with it. And then you ask them what they think it means. What does Paul mean <coughs> by believe? Yeah. Because you know, belief has become subjective. I think Jesus is Lord. That's who cares <laughs> what you think in that sense. It doesn't matter what you think. You can think Jesus is Lord. You can think Jesus is not Lord. You can think Satan is Lord. You can think whatever you can think. It's irrelevant. It's all meaningless. The question is, is Jesus in fact Lord? That has nothing to do with your opinion. And to the, the second element of belief, do you base your life upon the fact that Jesus is Lord? And then you can confess, which has a broader meaning than simply, you know, mutter some words. And remember, the mouth is the source of all defilement filth proceeds from nothing can defile you from without the defilement comes from within so right. the mouth lies so confess has a broader meaning than simply mumble these incomprehensible words it's that does your belief is that reflected in you That's what it means. It's not, you know, do I think this nice fuzzy thing and then do I say it? That's, you know, that's a meaningless activity. Anybody can do that. So, and then, you know, you can go from there. What makes you think salvation is an event? Why does Paul give such strong warnings about immorality. Why is it that Paul is, is so concerned? Uh, why why does, is Paul so condemning of uh, immorality that's, that he considers to be worse than pagan immorality? Why is that? You know, so the important thing is that Salvation is not an event, it's a process that we do cooperate with God's grace and with the Holy Spirit, that we grow in holiness. We can grow in holiness. We can imitate Christ. We are called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. So remember all of the, the you know, teachings, verses, particularly from the Sermon on the Mount, but generally from the Gospels about how 
Christians are to behave and how they're to produce good fruit and good works. And be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And, you know, reflect the Beatitudes. And what are Beatitudes? Beatitudes are the attributes of God. So, you know, so it's important in any case just to in, engage directly and, you know, not have a, sort of a parallel parallel line of argument that you know the catholic church teaches or whatever i mean that for for people who are anti-catholic that goes nowhere and you know the general view is that catholics don't understand the bible not only don't read the bible but even if they do accidentally read it they are clueless about the contents yet catholics are more informed than the others for the very fact that every Sunday. Right. right. Every Sunday. I guess I, I, the tone of a person who would come up to me and ask me that question would set the tone for my response, <laughs> whether I wanted to feel it was worth bringing them into a conversation or just, you know, thinking, you know, this, this person's a waste of time because well, they're just going to try to find argument in. Well, the tone is always going to be aggressive because their intention. So, you know, if you answer yes, then they know that, you know, you're another evangelical and that's good and so you know their intent the intention of the question is to get people saved you know it's like that whole thing with you know witnessing and you go out with your bible and you bump people on the heads and you concuss them and make them lose their better judgment so that they let jesus into their heart so you know, the, the answer is yes. And in that case, you know, they'll leave you alone or it's some hedging thing or a no, in which case they'll want to witness to you. And so, you know, since you never want to say yes, uh, it's an opportunity to uh, either walk away or to engage them depending, I mean, you know, it, it, you, you have to make the call on, you know, based on, um, you know, the person approaching you and your sort of assessment of the, the whole situation. But, but well, I'll just have you nearby. <laughs> <laughs> we'll invite you to see all, to meet all our friends that are so, <laughs> give us problems. <laughs> Love parties at the church. <laughs> so where are we going from here now? Uh, so next week we'll do the Eucharist. Uh, oh, so yeah. Yeah. so read read um, the Eucharistic verse, the Last Supper, in. Um, the three gospels, as well as in Paul, it's in first Corinthians. I'll send out the, uh, the precise citations probably tomorrow. Then also read the bread of life discourse. Bread of life discourse. And then I'll, I'll send out one additional article to read. Okay. And um, yeah, and so we'll 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 spend a, a number of weeks. I'm not sure how many on the Eucharist. Mm 